Okay, so let's run away those admin notes. All right, so um, chapter 14, we move into a new, a new area uh, called capital budgeting. And capital budgeting is about decisions to, to purchase capital assets. Um, and typically we refer to cap, uh, what we're referring to with capital assets are large assets, expensive assets, uh, that cost a lot of money for the organization. And, you know, it's kind of like if you were going, um, you know, in your own life, um, you decide, you know what, I need a new, you know, I need a new pen, right? Uh, my old pen's running out, I'm gonna go buy a new pen. You're, you're not really gonna spend a lot of time uh, thinking through, should I get a new pen? What kind of pen should I get? You know, doing a lot of evaluation. It's a relatively small asset. You know, you go out, you spend $2 on one pen. Like, ah, oh, you know, I don't really like that pen. Let me get this pen, you know. Um, so it's not really a, a big deal to you, right? But if you're going to go out and buy a new car, for example, uh, you should, uh, hopefully, would spend a fair amount of time thinking about, um, you know, what kind of car should I buy, right? How much do I want to spend? Um, you know, does it meet all the needs that I have? You know, do I, uh, can I you know, get by with a two seater or, uh, you know, do I need a sporty car so that I can, you know, uh, cruise around Durham and, you know, um, uh, impress all the, um, all my potential dates or is it, uh, you know, or do I need a, you know, a minivan because, you know, I need to, tote around a bunch of kids, whatever that, you know, that is, you know, so, so, you know, some, if you're boring like me, you know, you drive, you drive an old mini, old broke down minivan because you don't care. Um, uh, but, uh, but, you know, at some point on my mini, my, so my minivan that I always tell you about, uh, it started making a new noise. So I'm starting to think uh, it might be time uh, to retire at you know, 100 and almost 180,000 miles. Yeah, I know, right? Um, uh, so almost 180,000 miles. I was hoping to drive it for a few more years. We'll see. Um, so I'm coming up on a point where I have to make, you know, what would be a personal capital budgeting decision. Um, because a car is not an insignificant uh, purchase, and it's a long-term investment. So it's kind of a, the, the key here is, this is a, 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 for capital budgeting, organizations think through the, think the same kind of way, right? Buying, what kind of pen do you buy? You know, do we use uh, what kind of, you know, copy paper? Those are all just kind of uh, decisions that we can easily undo, right? Or we can, you know, we're constantly buying more of these kinds of things. So no big deal, right? But if you buy a car, it's a, it's a big deal. And if you get a car and you don't like it, it's a big deal to get, get rid of it and replace it with something else, right? It's expensive, uh, especially, you know, you buy a car new, uh, as soon as you drive it off the lot, it loses a few thousand dollars in value. So, there, so you need to take time to think about that. And organizations think the same way, right? So buying copy paper or pens, no big deal. Those can be, you know, you're kind of continuously buying them. You can just change your decision, uh, throw away the old one, get a new one. But if it comes down to, you know, should we build a new building um, or lease a different building, right? Should we buy a, an expensive piece of, you know, two different, we, we're going to compare two different expensive pieces of equipment and make a decision, you know, should we get an MRI, should we, or, or not? Um, should we uh, build a, you know, put together a new practice, for example, um, and that would require a large upfront investment, as well as ongoing costs. Um, so we're going to, we're going to really focus, capital budgeting is really focused on assets, not so much ongoing business lines. So um, building a new clinic, there's a piece to it that is a capital asset decision. But usually, if you build a new clinic, you're intending to build that business you're building a business, not just, you know, it's not just about a piece of equipment. So, and we were going to get, we'll get into that, uh, that kind of decision-making more in chapter 15. So, but this is going to help us start to think through looking at business lines by starting to look at large, um, large investments. So uh, most of the examples we'll do uh, in this chapter are going to be focused on um, large investments that have a limited uh, life, um, which is a lot of what we've kind of done in the past. We're going to tweak it a little bit um, uh, and focus in on cash flow.
Uh, okay, so I'm going to switch my camera view here so I can write some notes and you can follow along and take notes um, uh, as I discuss these things. So just give me one sec here to flip my camera. All right. And let me, let me give the camera a second. And do let me know if, it's, uh, if it winds up going out of focus and you can't uh, follow. Uh, also about, uh, we're gonna get into this um, and it's, uh, at some point, I'm gonna give you some kind of some background notes. And then at some point I'm gonna switch to work in Excel. Uh, so just be prepared. I'm, I'm hoping to do a Excel, uh, some Excel work and have you follow along with it. Uh, with me doing it. Okay, so we've been taught, we're going to be talking about capital budgeting. I should probably get like a little dry erase, a little tiny dry erase board um, so I can, so I can stop wasting so much paper. Um, all right, so we're talking about capital budgeting and most organizations um, have a methodology for deciding um, uh, or, or kind of analyzing capital budgeting um, uh, decisions. And so not every, every uh, acquisition is the same. Um, and so our book works through a set of um, kind of a taxonomy uh, or a way uh, of that organizations could potentially organize their decision-making uh, around different categories of, uh, of capital budget acquisition. So our book uses a couple of cat just simple categories. Um, I'm not going to make you expect you to memorize these, but, um, and I didn't use cat one, cat two, cat three, you know, in the army, we had a different system. Um, so every system, every hospital, and every system is going to have their own methodology, but it's going to be organized roughly like this. Um, and, and so the categories, whereas everything's not going to be called cat A, uh, cat one, cat two, um, the categories are pretty consistent. Okay. So cat one um, in your book is mandatory uh, replacement. So this is going to be, so you're in the budgeting cycle. If you're working in finance, um, you're probably going to be working with, with uh, uh, you know, different parts of the hospital. So you might have, so in, in the army, in the health, in the army healthcare system, um, I was the finance guy and we had a logistics uh, person um, who, who actually did the acquisition work in the organization. So in some um, some organizations, you're going to see that separated, probably in a civilian organization that'll roll up to the CFO, um, that function, the acquisition function. Um, but this kind of, so you would sit down at the, you know, during the budgeting process and your person who's in charge of logistics for your organization, the person that's in charge of kind of equipment management of your, of your equipment, uh, we'll have an idea, we'll kind of have a list of equipment that um, is, that uh, is approaching its end of its useful life, right? And so mandatory replacement is typically, you know, you're going to put equipment in this category that, you know, it's necessary uh, for the functioning of the hospital or other healthcare organization, you know, uh, uh, any organization, right? So not just a hospital. So mandatory the functioning of the organization. So for example, um, if you have a, an emergency room, you need to have a CT, a CT scanner. Um, CT scanners are used uh, to evaluate head injuries um, and other kinds of uh, trauma. And so if you have an emergency room, then you need to have a CT. So if you're, if you're uh, you know, working in a hospital with an emergency room and your CT scanner is towards the end of its useful life, um, uh, that would fall into mandatory replacement. Um, so necessary for the functioning of the hospital. Uh, uh, so also if the item is worn out uh, or damaged, especially if the item is worn out or damaged, right? So this would be something um, uh, uh, that needs to be, you know, there's a need for ongoing functioning um, and it needs to be replaced. And so the level of analysis here is low, right? So you're going to wind up with limited analysis. If your chief of radiology or the, or, or, or 
you know, your director of radiology comes in and says, you know what, we've had to call maintenance, you know, numerous times for our CT scanner. Um, and we believe that, you know, we are, you know, one or two incidents away from having, uh, having to close the ED because we don't have a CT scanner. Um, you are going to, you're not, you know, you, if you're sitting, you know, as a CFO at looking, you know, talking to the CEO, uh, you're going to be like, you know, we just, we're just going to have to find the money for that. Uh, it isn't really an optional thing. We can't put it off. So you're just going to, you're not really going to do any analysis. You're just going to be like, all right, how much is it? We're going to buy it. So cat one, mandatory, uh, mandatory replacement for things that um, are essential for the functioning of the organization. Um, cat two, so we're kind of, we have kind of a hierarchy, right? That hence the, the numbering system. Uh, cat two is discretionary replacement. So discretionary meaning we have choice, right? Um, so you might want to replace serviceable, meaning still usable, uh, but obsolete. Equipment, right? So um, maybe we have a um, we have an MRI uh, scanner, right? We have an MRI, um, but it's a closed MRI, and so uh, you know, for marketing purposes, we want to replace our existing MRI with uh, which is a closed MRI with an open MRI, so that we can advertise to you know. Uh, our patient population that, hey, we've got this fancy new MRI here in our hospital or our imaging center or whatever. Um, and wouldn't you rather come to our, uh, to get your MRI done here, uh, where you're going to have an, you know, where it, you are not going to be inserted into a uh, coffin-like tube, uh, you know, for an hour while we do your MRI scan. Instead, you'll have this open MRI where, you know, you'll feel a little more comfortable. Um, you know, or maybe it is, uh, you know, we've got lab equipment um, and there's a new generation of lab equipment. Um, and the lab equipment that we have in the past uh, uses more reagents or is not able to run as many tests. And so your lab director has come to you and said, you know, the equipment we have still works, but this newfangled uh, uh, gee whiz uh, lab equipment that I'm looking at could uh, potentially reduce the amount of staff that we need, or we could turn around uh, uh, requests faster. Um, so that would be, you know, that's an example of uh, discretionary replacement where the thing you have still works, right? And it still functions, but uh, you might want to replace it uh, in order to either improve quality, right? Uh, improve patient experience. So uh, you're going to consider quality, patient experience, right? Or cost, of course, and preferably all three, right? Um, so, so this is going to take a lot more analysis. Cat two is going to take a lot more analysis than cat one, right? Because you've got to make a business case. You're going to hear that phrase a lot. You've got to make a business case, right? That's a B, business. You've got to make a business case um, to, to do this. You've got to be able to prove to, hopefully, you know, your leadership is going to hold you, you know, accountable for that and say, you know, you've got to come up with a good uh, uh, reason why we should do that, right? And it may be, you know, yeah, you could get a, a marginally more quality, but is it really worth the extra money. Um, we could get, you know, slightly better patient experience, but can we afford that? You know, maybe there's a higher priority thing that we want to do. Um, but either way, when you're getting away from mandatory into discretionary, uh, you've got to make, you've got to spend time making your case. All right, so that's cat, uh, cat one, cat two. And like I said, um, organizations will use different taxonomies, meaning, you know, taxonomy is a, a, a set of phrases for, for something. Um, but, but typically we follow, uh, you know, every organization I have worked with has some sort of prioritization uh, uh, process for deciding, uh, you know, when to make an investment. Um, CAT 3 would be, say, this is another example, expansion, 
of existing services or um, markets, right? So that's services, SVCS, so services or markets. So here we're, um, we're definitely going to, uh, uh, so we're not just looking at uh, a piece of equipment, but we're looking at that piece of equipment as part of a larger uh, decision to try to um, expand services. So, um, you know, you know, you might want to increase uh, capacity uh, or uh, increase presence in a market. So a couple of examples. Um, I don't know how many of you guys go uh, up, up, uh, up Route 108 up into Dover, uh, like heading towards Route 16. Um, you know, past Dover High School, uh, but not that long ago, Portsmouth Regional Hospital built a standalone ED uh, in Dover, right? Um, so that is a, an expansion uh, of their presence in the marketplace. Uh, that's pretty inflammatory um, strategic move uh, to drop a to drop a ED in Dover. Um, because that is uh, Wentworth Douglas's kind of home turf, right? So, uh, so Wentworth Douglas is in Dover, as you hopefully all know, uh, since we've talked about it so many times. Um, and then Portsmouth is, you know, next town over. Um, and so Portsmouth dropped a, you know, standalone ED um, in in uh, Dover's uh, in Wentworth Douglas's backyard. I mean, we're talking that's like three miles from. Uh, uh, from Wentworth Douglas, uh, with the idea that that you know you go to the um, standalone ED, and then the doctors refer you for any follow up care over to Portsmouth Regional and not Wentworth Douglas. Now the flip side of this is um, Wentworth Douglas doing a very similar thing um, by building uh, a huge outpatient center uh, on the old Pease Air Force Base space, right? In Portsmouth, um, so so that is a represents both an increase in presence as well as an increase in capacity. Um, you know they've opened up several new practices uh, over there um, uh, on Pease in essentially in Portsmouth's backyard. So two organizations that we you know we are intimately familiar with living in the seacoast area, both doing these kinds of things, but that would be. Um, an example of an expansion of services of existing services um, or markets, right? So both of them are trying to expand into, into related markets. And, you know, Wentworth Douglas is looking at creating a standalone ED, um, you know, to potentially counter be a counterweight to some of Portsmouth stuff. So it's just, that's, that's the nature of business, but this is going to require um, a more complex, right? So the decision, is you know it's more complex um uh more detailed it's going to require more analysis um and it's going to rely a lot on a lot of assumptions right so it's gonna you're gonna have to make a lot of guesses about the future um so this is a complex one and takes a lot of time and thought um So this is existing services, right? And then CAT4 is kind of the same idea uh, into new services. Um, so this would be, you know, we previously didn't offer um, some sort of advanced care. So a better example of this would be rather than, you know, Wentworth Douglas and, and, and Portsmouth are, are pretty, um, have, have quite a bit of capacity, but let's imagine, um, you know, I know a couple of you are applying to do your internship at Valley Regional, which is up in Claremont, right? Valley Regional is a small, uh, uh, small uh, critical access hospital. Sorry, I couldn't bring up critical access hospital from the hard drive. It was uh, sitting there. Uh, so critical access hospital, you know, 25 beds, uh, so they've got a fairly limited uh, set of services. You know, they, 
they do some general surgery, they do some orthopedic surgery, uh, they do, um, you know, they do a lot of primary care, basic internal medicine. So, you know, one question would be, do we want to do, um, <laughs> what's the word afternoon? <laughs> Sorry, uh, services, yes. That's my shorthand for services, SVCS, services, there we go. Um, so, uh, so expansion of new services. So this would be, oh, do we want to um, maybe do some sort of uh, more advanced uh, surgeries or do we want to create a um, uh, EP lab or a cath lab? Um, where we're going to do, you know, some sort of proceed, you know, cardiology procedures that requires, that's, that would be a new, you know, completely new set of services as opposed to, Hey, um, we want to expand. We were already doing orthopedics. Um, let's expand, uh, or, you know, our presence, let's do more orthopedics. Let's, let's double the size of our orthopedics, uh, presence, or let's put our orthopedics in the next town over, like, uh, you know, like uh, 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 kind of what I was describing um, with uh, Portsmouth and Dover, right? They already have EDs. So by Portsmouth putting an ED in Dover, they're expanding an existing service into a new market, right? Dover, uh, uh, Wentworth Douglas, um, already has orthopedics, already has, a, you know, all the, you know, cancer care um, by taking and building new outpatient center over in Portsmouth, uh, in Portsmouth Regional's backyard over there on um, uh, Pease, right? They're expanding, uh, they're expanding the size of their existing services and into a new market. Okay, so here I'm talking about like Valley Regional doing something they haven't done before, right? So, um, so in cat four would be an expansion, you know, a whole new service line. Um, and it doesn't have to be something as dramatic as cardiology. It could be just, you know, a new, you know, maybe we're going to create a, a weight loss clinic, right? We haven't had one of those. And, you know, maybe we've got this new primary care doc who's really excited about trying to do weight loss uh, work. And so, you know, we, we, might expand into something like weight loss and counseling. And so we'd have to, you know, hire a dietitian and hire some other people, get space, um, you know, maybe build some sort of gym equipment. So people, you know, we could kind of have this wraparound set of services, whatever it would be, you know, that'd be an example of a cat four. Uh, now cat five is a special case, and this is going to be your environmental projects. Um, and typically, uh, these are going to be must do's and are treated very much like um, uh, cat one. And so these are environment of care. Remember, we talked about that in management one, environment of care is, you know, life safety kind of stuff. And we see a lot of that going on right now with, you know, with uh, uh, the COVID-19 response. So organizations are doing all kinds of, are making lots of rapid fire decisions um, to probably make physical modifications to their, uh, to their clinical spaces uh, to try to protect their staff and, and patients um, from COVID-19. And so we start talking about life safety means, hey, if we don't do this, somebody might get hurt, right? Somebody might die. Uh, somebody might get electrocuted. Somebody might, you know, we might have a leak of uh, medical gases, something like that. These are typically treated as kind of like, uh, like I said, treat li uh, often treated like cat one. In that they are mandatory replacements. So they don't get as much necessarily as much analysis. Um, oftentimes they are uh, required to comply with government, government regulations. So there's a compliance element, right? So, if the Joint Commission comes in, um, so the Joint Commission, remember, is, is an organization that inspects hospitals um, and decides whether you are meeting uh, life, in particular, they have a big life safety component. And so they decide, is your, you know, is your hospital uh, a safe space for patients? 
Um, Long-term care has has the same kind of thing. They don't get it from the Joint Commission. They typically, uh, most most long-term care organizations are inspected directly by the state. So the state has a uh, compliance unit that, um, you know, they get uh, the they send out inspectors. So the state of New Hampshire has inspectors and they get sent out um, and they uh, periodically go to nursing homes to inspect uh, the life safety kind of components. So right now, for example, would be, you know, are, are you taking appropriate precautions to uh, isolate your um, residents, particularly if any of your residents uh, show signs of of being infected uh, in the uh, the week before spring break. I think it was. I went to a. Um, I think it was the Wednesday before uh, spring break. I went to my quarterly nursing home uh, administrator licensing board. I'm on the licensing board for for nursing home administrators, um, and I uh, was talking with one of the administrators, and and I was asked her how she was dealing with the COVID nineteen stuff, and she was like, at that point, it hadn't really we hadn't, you know, we seem to be moving at lightning speed on this and everything seems to constantly change. It seems like a forever ago now. Um, but I was asking her, you know, about, you know, how, what was the impact uh, of COVID-19? She said, well, I'm worried about that. But right now I have flu in my, uh, in one of my homes, right, in one of my buildings. And so I'm, ha she was already in this kind of uh, uh, lockdown mode where she was, you know, having to isolate uh, residents from each other. Um, so, so you, you know, if, if that becomes known to, uh, your inspectors, whether that's joint commission or whether that's, you know, the state, uh, and there are a whole variety of different organizations that go out and inspect things like life safety, uh, requirements. If they get word, you know, or, or, or an indication, that there might be, you know, your organization might not uh, be in compliance, they will very likely send out an inspector to check to see, you know, what your status is. So when an organization says, oh boy, you know, we've got a thing, um, uh, a situation that is, a, you know, an environment of care concern, um, they very often, often, uh, they, well, they, they generally prioritize that um, because it's a safety thing and you don't want to, you know, it's not just that you don't want an inspector to come find it. It's that you don't want one of your patients or one of your staff to get hurt, um, you know, because that kind of defeats the purpose of the mission, but it's also really bad for business. Um, so cat five um, special category uh, that is treated like cat one, um, but, and given a high priority. And then cat six is kind of your other, um, you know, it's everything else. And uh, generally low priority. Right. And so, uh, so you're going to have, you know, if you get into the into the finance side of things, uh, most likely you, this will be part of your annual budgeting cycle uh, is you will, you know, you will, you will look at the operational budget, which is, you know, looking at supplies and, and labor costs and, and things like that. And then you typically kind of in a separate process, uh, look at uh, the capital budgeting uh, uh, plans and capital budgeting, like I said, is these are big dollar items. And so the organization doesn't take them lightly. Usually they have to be approved by the board, right? There's a, there's usually a, a threshold um, above which uh, uh, or below which management can make a decision. So, you know, you might be able, if you're a director, you might be able to make up to say a $10,000 purchase. Uh, and then the CEO might be able to approve say, so, you know, maybe director can do, you know, less than 10,000, uh, CEO, maybe, uh, CEO 10. That's, that's not, yeah, there we go. Uh, you know, under a hundred thousand, right. And then board, uh, anything greater than a hundred thousand. All right. So that, uh, Right. So if you're a director, you might be able to approve, you know, in your own budget, you might be able to approve, say, 
uh, an expenditure of up to ten thousand dollars. So you can fix fix important equipment. Um, you know, you can order s replacement parts for your um, you know for your lab equipment or something like that. Um, but if it's going to be you know uh, making a decision a decision about you know buying a a, a new uh, a new piece of equipment um, that maybe you know fits into one of these categories like you know. Um, I want to, let's go back to, oh, not that. Those are my notes. All right, so, you know, up to $10,000. If I've got something that broke, I can fix it, right? Cat one, you know, um, maybe, you know, if I'm a director and I want to replace something and it's got a, so remember capital budgeting, we're focused on PPE, right? Property plant and equipment, stuff that's not going to wear out uh, in a year. We're going to be holding on to that for a couple of years. So, you know, if I'm a director and I, you know, and I've got this cool new piece of equipment that I think I could get and it costs less than $10,000, maybe I could just do that on my own. But if it's going to cost $50,000, I've got to run it all the way up. You know, it's got to be brief to the to the C-suite um, and the CEO has got to approve it. Or, you know, I want something really expensive like, uh, you know, a new MRI machine that's going to cost you know, two, two and a half million. Um, that's got to go to the board because it's going to have a significant impact. So typically you've got this system of, you know, this structure of uh, how to analyze um, uh, uh, the the or categorize your your decision making and different levels of 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 you know categories have different levels of decision making. Some of them are just going to be hey we just got to do that right. Um, uh, the HVAC you know uh, maybe needs to be repaired or something like that. We're just going to do that because that's a that's an environment of care life safety thing. Um, we need to put up uh, uh, you know barriers in our ED so that when people come in, um, they aren't coughing directly onto our registration staff because, you know, COVID-19. So, you know, I, I imagine any place that had, you know, uh, um, open air uh, registration um, uh, functions in their ED now have you know, some sort of barrier between patients coming to check in and, uh, and the staff, right? So that would be in a, like a life safety thing that would get just done immediately. Um, and then, you know, if it's, if it's just putting up some uh, glass or, you know, or, or, or some sort of plexiglass barrier, that might be under 10,000. So the, you know, the ED director could maybe just say, go do that. Um, maybe it's, you know, it could be something, you know, maybe it involved, uh, maybe it involves changing some ventilation or something, in which case it might be a 50 or $75,000 uh, decision, then the CEO would decide that. Uh, and then anything, you know, like, hey, we, we need to acquire uh, we want to put up an, uh, an exterior building of some sort, maybe a temporary building uh, to process people who are coming in saying that they think they have uh, COVID-19. That would have to go up to the, to the board because that might cost a million dollars to put in place. Right? So, so these kinds of processes you will become familiar with uh, when you go uh, to work in, 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 in an organization. And you'll do that regardless of whether you are, you know, technically in the finance section or if you're in operations or, you know, anywhere else, you're going to have to, as you move into leadership, you're going to be dealing with budgeting questions. Okay. So that's kind of the broad picture of, um, of, of capital budgeting. The key things to remember about capital budgeting is we're talking about large expenditures of long-lived assets, right? So assets that are, these are not your current assets that you're going to use up. So it's not like, should we buy, you know, more masks, right? It is, uh, should we buy, you know, how many ventilators should we buy going forward, right? Ventilators cost, you know, $100,000 each. Uh, how many should we have? Should we have five, you know, 10? Um, you know, how often are we going to use them when there's no pandemic? That's a thing that organizations are going to start having to think about. Uh, and, and that JACO or the Joint Commission, you know, might come down and say, hey, hospitals, you know, from here on out, you might have to have a certain number of ventilators. I'm sure they have something like that already. Uh, I never had to be, I was never in that level of uh, detail on the clinical side. Um, but, you know, they may enhance uh, there are requirements for number of ventilators that you just have available uh, 
uh, in order to deal with mass casualty situations, in, in this case, a pandemic. Um, so, you know, that might be a thing going forward. Lots of organizations are probably going to be acquiring more ventilators. Well, if you buy a, something like a ventilator and it's going to, you know, it's good for 10 years, if you're, even if you're not using it, you're going to have to do periodic maintenance on it to make sure that it still works. You're going to still have, you're going to have to replace any of the parts that might, you know, wear out whether they're being used or not. So, you know, if you have rubber seals, for example, um, and, and that's almost certainly the case with ventilators. Uh, those, those rubber seals uh, wear out, uh, uh, don't wear out, the, but they, you know, decay, right? They decay over time. If you've ever, you know, you've seen old rubber things, right? They gradually um, uh, kind of uh, uh, lose their flexibility and their ability to hold seals. And so you have to just periodically replace those in order to make sure if you've got 10 ventilators, uh, that's great. But if, if they all have crappy seals and you can't actually use them, then they're useless, right? So you acquire ventilators and then you're going to have this, um, you know, you're going to have this maintenance cost for each of the ventilators going for, for the life of the ventilators, right? So all these things require uh, kind of thoughtful decision-making. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I know, uh, 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 we made, you know, we made a decision. I, one of my first, uh, uh, my first CFO job, we were doing year end, uh, closeout and we had a bunch of money. I may have told you this story, but we had a bunch of money left at the end, you know, last second, we always have, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars laying around that we need to get spent because in the government, um, you, you get a budget. And if you don't spend all your budget, typically the next year, they take some of your budget away, whatever you didn't spend, they just they come back and say, uh, the higher level government agency will come to you and say, well, you didn't, apparently, you didn't need all the money we gave you last year. So we're going to give you less this year. So the game in, you know, in, in finance, in the federal, well, in, in government in general, is you always want to spend all of your money. So at the end of the year, as we cleaned up our, you know, and closed out our accounts, we would find, okay, we got a little extra money. We would typically buy IT equipment because it was really easy to do. You could just go online and, and order a bunch of stuff um, from different catalogs. And one of the things that we had that was kind of low priority um, uh, would have fit, say, a category, um, you know, uh, uh, two, you know, discretionary replacement option. So was my IT, my, my CIO wanted uh, to get a great big battery backup for all of the servers that we had in the hospital. And this thing ran like, I don't know, $300,000. So it turned out we had you know, enough money to, to buy that at the end of the, with year end money. Um, and since it was year end money and we would lose it if we didn't, if we didn't use it, um, we went ahead and bought that $300,000 battery backup. Unfortunately, um, we didn't, well, I, I, unfortunately the CIO hadn't coordinated with the logistics staff to actually talk about what it would take to um, make that uh, battery backup operational. And it turned out it required uh, some facilities changes. So they actually had to like come in and knock down a wall and then they had to install a bunch of power. So it wound up costing, you know, like an additional hundred thousand dollars to install the $300,000 backup, which wound up having to come because when the backup battery showed up two months later, we were already into the next year. And so we wound up having to spend money out of the next year's money, $100,000 out of the next year's money that we hadn't budgeted um, in order to install the backup battery that we had bought with the prior year's money. So it's really important to think through when you make an acquisition like that, it's really important to think through all of the associated costs um, of, of installing, maintaining, right? When you make ac big acquisitions. And we're going to, the example we're going to work with uh, here in a few minutes involves uh, in part uh, working with uh, or, or taking into consideration um, uh, installation costs. All right. So we've talked about kind of the categories and kind of the taxonomy and how, how we do, you know, levels of analysis, right? So cat one, relatively little analysis, 
because it's stuff that we need in order to keep functioning. Cat two, we're gonna we're gonna replace something that's functioning, um, but maybe it'll make our organization a little better, right? So we're definitely gonna engage in a business case in that case, right? Cat three and cat four are expansions of services, either into new, you know, existing services into uh, 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 or expansion of existing services into new markets or just expansion of, you know, twice as much orthopedics, right? Or we're going to take our orthopedics and we're going to expand into a new market. That's definitely going to have a business case if we're going to expand uh, into new services. So start something new that we uh, don't already do. That's going to require a, a, a detailed business case. And then we come to cat five, which is kind of a special, you know, if it's a life safety thing, we're going to do it one way or another. Uh, in order to keep our patients and our staff safe. And then CAT6 is kind of everything else, goes into lower priorities. We have some sort of decision-making hierarchy as well about who can, who can order um, uh, or, or make the decisions on those, even, even with those different categories. There are different levels of expenditure that, and different levels of approval. Right? So those are all things you're really going to see all this when you get out into the field. Um, all right. So when we go out and do this, right, um, we're going to have some things we have to, th to think about. Um, our basic approach is going to be to focus on cash flows. So going from here on, we're going to talk a lot more about cash flow and a lot less about um, accounting profit. Um, we're going to be very interested in um, how much cash actually comes in as a result of the project rather than what hits the, uh, what shows up as accounting profit. And we care about that because at the end of the day, uh, businesses don't spend their accounting profit, they spend their cash, right? And they either spend their cash uh, to buy new equipment and, and expand services and grow the organization so that the organization is worth more, or they spend that cash by giving it back to investors in the form of dividends. So we're going to be particularly focused on cash flows. Um, and so the kind of the overview of how we're going to uh, do this is this sort of a um, four-step process. So step one is we're going to, and this is very, these are very broad brush, Estab, uh, establish, uh, sorry, estimate, not establish, estimate, can't read my own writing, uh, estimate cash flows, I'm going to abbreviate cash flows as CF uh, from the project, right, um, to uh, assess riskiness of the project, Uh, three, uh, uh, estimate the corporate cost of capital uh, for the project, given its risk, right? So we've talked before, you know, we use, if something is riskier, we're going to use a higher uh, cost of capital than something that's less risky. Um, and then four is assess the financial impact on the organization. So as we think about this, right, we're going to estimate the cash flow from the project. Um, so estimating cash flow involves um, Uh, estimating initial outlays, right? Estimate initial outlays. And we're going to do this and hopefully we'll have time today. Um, but initial outlays. So uh, we're going to buy new equipment. That's, an, you know, that's their, our initial outlays, right? So that might include things like purchasing equipment. Um, Preparing the space, like my story I just told, preparing space, right, which might include um, power, uh, ventilation, et cetera, right? So um, we're going to estimate 
annual net operating flows. So this, this new project is gonna bring in some amount of revenue and it's going to have some amount of expenses, right? So our net um, operating flows are gonna be, you know, is, is kind of your annual profit, if you will. Um, but we'll think about it as, as net cash flows um, for the year and revenue, right? Uh, so we wanna get to net cash flows uh, for each year. And then we'll want to think about termination cash flows. So when the project ends, do we sell the equipment? Do we have salvage value, right? So we're going to you know, buy a new MRI machine. Our old MRI machine still works. Um, we're going to, we're not going to just throw the thing away. We're going to go through a dealer that maybe, you know, this is commonplace. Uh, you'll see uh, uh, there are organizations that will come in and purchase, say, an old MRI from, an, from a, a hospital that is upgrading its MRI, say, from an old closed MRI to a new uh, uh, open MRI. And this, you know, these dealers will come in and they'll, they will buy the old MRI from the hospital. And then they'll, they'll move the, the old MRI and they'll either sell it to a, maybe a small hospital, you know, small rural hospital, or they might take the MRI and sell it to a, uh, in, you know, to a developing country. So maybe they'll take, you know, uh, Wentworth Douglas recently replaced its MRI um, uh, uh, equipment uh, and they got a new MRI. So uh, I don't know exactly what they did with it, but I would imagine probably what happened was a dealer came in, uh, purchased the MRI from them and then sold it, you know, to say uh, a hospital in uh, Peru, right? Um, uh, so uh, a lot of our old medical equipment gets uh, uh, sold you know, on the secondary market. So, you know, in the U.S., we have kind of the, the top end newest equipment, and, but the rest of the world often buys our old used equipment. So this is kind of the process of estimating the uh, uh, cash flows. So that's kind of step one. Step two, we're going to assess the riskiness of the project. And so uh, we will decide what discount rate should we be using uh, for this project based on its riskiness. Well, you know, maybe uh, uh, a, you know, buying a replacement MRI is not particularly risky. We have a really good idea of how much the demand will be, but maybe building a, a standalone ED say in, you know, for Wentworth Douglas to build a standalone ED, maybe in say Rochester um, to compete with, uh, you know, Portsmouth uh, HCA, you know, is acquiring Frisbee, uh, Frisbee Memorial, uh, the, the little hospital up in Rochester. Um, so maybe Wentworth Douglas wants to build a, um, a standalone ED up in, um, uh, up in Rochester. How risky is that project? You know, what, how should we, we have some uh, corporate cost of capital that's standard for our organization. Um, so maybe when we're Douglas, he normally uses a 6% corporate cost of capital, but this investment is kind of risky. Uh, you know, Portsmouth could, you know, uh, do things to try to route, uh, route traffic away from us. There could be a lot of, you know, we could be wrong about our assumptions of utilization. And so we've got to decide, is this a high risk project or a low risk project? And so we take that and we say, okay, if our, you know, if our standard co co cost of capital, if our base cost of capital is say 6%, um, and we say, you know what, this project is a riskier project, we're going to add on an extra 2%. Um, so we will have an adjusted cost of capital of 8% that we will apply to this project as opposed to say buying an MRI, right? So that's kind of step three is find the appropriate corporate cost of capital. And then finally, step four would be, 
all right, we've estimated the revenues that we think we're going to get from, from the project. Uh, we've, est we've, we've considered how risky the project is, and that's allowed us to estimate the appropriate discount rate to apply to the, to the cash flows from the project. What is our NPV, IRR, or we're going to introduce a new idea um, in this chapter, the modified internal rate of return, right? These are all our tools for evaluating whether we should do a project or not, right? So our last step is to say, all right, does this project have a um, positive NPV? Um, a, 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 does the IRR exceed our hurdle rate or a corporate cost of capital um, or not? Now, We're going to talk about um, some other, so let me just hit a couple of other ideas. Um, and well, we'll see if we have time to actually do the, do start, the um, uh, start the example this time or not. Uh, cash flow timing matters a lot. Cash flow timing matters. Um, and remember, right? Zero, one, two, three, four. You know, um, if I get a thousand dollars a year from now, or a thousand dollars four years from now, um, this thousand dollars is worth more than this thousand dollars, right? Because we are discounting this by four years as opposed to discounting this one by a thousand years. So it matters, right? Whether we get you know a thousand, a thousand, a thousand like that, or we have a project. where we get zeros, uh, not zero here, but zero, 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 four thousand. That's not the same thing as getting a thousand, 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 which adds up to four thousand dollars, right? The cash flows add up to uh, four thousand dollars is not the same thing as um, getting four thousand dollars at the end of, uh, of four years. And just kind of check to see if you're paying attention. Uh, which one is, is, going to have a higher, uh, a higher um, NPV, A or B. And it doesn't matter what the discount rate is, and it doesn't really matter what the initial investment is. We just got one guess. Come on now. <laughs> all right, G. So you're covering all your you're covering all your bases. Okay, A, B, oh, A, A. Okay, they're the same. No, they're not the same. All right, we're starting to see some consensus here. All right, so the answer is A. Why is the answer A? Who, who wants to? You can unmute and just give me an answer real quick, or you can type it, I guess. The answer is A. Option A is gaining interest for four years. Uh, yeah. It's not really gaining interest per se, right? It, it is, we are actually moving these things back, right? to the present. And then this one. It does have to do with the payment amounts. So Sam said, does it have to do with the payment amounts? Yes. Um, so let's say that the um, cost of capital for both for these projects is 8%. Right. And I mean, we could pick an arbitrary cost. Let's say it's $2,000. So they both, so projects A and B both cost $2,000 to do. 
in project A, you get $1,000 at year one, two, three, and four. Uh, project B, you get $4,000, but you have to wait four years to get it. So this one, right, so let me, let me give myself a little more space. Um, so we had A, right, we wind up with one, two, three, right, zero, one, two, three, four. Um, we put $2,000 in, we get 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. B, zero, one, two, three, four we get 4,000, 2,000 in, right? <clears throat> this one's relatively easy to calculate. When I bring this back and I said that the core cost capital is 8%, right? What do I do to um, calculate what the net present value of B is going to be? So Jisoo, yes, that's correct. The money is worth more in the present than in the future, that's true. So to move my 4,000 back to the present, what do I do? Oh, <laughs> thank you. I'll go back to showing you the actual, sorry. My charming face does not, uh, does not help you visualize what I'm, I'm talking about. So A, four payments, you know, $1,000 each, $2,000 initial outlay, cost of capital 8%, right? So I'm going to bring back, bring back, bring back, bring back, right? How do I, do, let's start with the easy one. How do I, what's this worth? What's this $4,000 payment worth at time zero? You don't even really need a TVM to do it, but you can. No, it's worth more than zero, Peter, but thank you for the guess. All right, so got my calculator, right? Uh, if I did TVM, um, well, let's, uh, we don't even need, really need TVM uh, for this one, right? So the present value, our present value formula is simply future value divided by one plus I to the, to the N, right? So in this case, that future value is 4,000 divided by one plus I, I is 8%, so 1.08, and the N is four. So 4,000 divided by 1.08 to the fourth, right, is, I'll do 1.08 uh, raised to the fourth power is 1.36, I'm gonna invert that. So 0.735 times 4,000 gives me, my $4,000 is worth 29.40. So I have a NPV of minus 2000 plus 2940 or 940. All right, so 4000 is worth 2940. 4000 four years from now at 8% is worth 2940 today. Um, the other way I could have done that was said my future value is 4000, right? My discount rate is 8%, my N is four, compute my PV and I get 2940, right? Here, I could do this same calculation, 
right, for each of these cash flows. So this one would be 1,000 divided by 1.08. This one would be 1,000 divided by 1.08 squared. This would be 1,000 divided by 1.08 cubed. This would be 1,000 divided by 1.08 uh, to the fourth, right? Or I could, you know, what is this? Right? Is this a lump sum? Is this an annuity? What is that? Uh, it's an annuity. Uh, so all the stuff you learned so far is not going anywhere. Um, so clear our TVM. So the easiest thing to do here would be rather than doing this calculation for each of these, I'm going to just do an annuity calculation. So I have a thousand, a $1,000 payment, right? Uh, four is my N, eight is my interest rate per year, uh, compute my PV, and I get 3312 is my PV um, for if I get $1,000 each year. And so then my NPV would be the minus 2000 plus 3312 would be uh, 1312, right? So the NPV for this one is 1312. This one is 940. I got $4,000 in cash, in cash flows, right? Um, but the timing, the whole point of this was timing matters, right? When I get the cash flows matters. I had to wait four years for all $4,000 to come in. But here I got a thousand a year from now, in which case I could take that money and, and invest it and start earning more money, right? And then I got another thousand two years from now. These are all not going to be discounted as much as this one is because they're, they're happening closer to me, right? They're closer to me in time. So the earlier you get the cash flow, the more it's worth to you because as Jisoo said a minute ago, the money is worth more in the present than it is in the future. So the closer that the cash flows are to the present, the more they're worth to you. All right. So just remember, you know, we're going to do uh, a bunch of this kind of work here uh, going forward, both in chapters uh, well, in all three of the remaining chapters. All right. So cash flow timing matters, right? The more predictable the cash flow is also, right? The more predictable these cash flows are, the more valuable they are. So if there's uncertainty in, introduced into this, remember from uh, our chapter, was it 10 when we did, you know, we were looking at uh, different states of nature, you know, expected values, right? If these are not certain, then they're worth less to you as well. Um, let's see, I'll skip that. We need to think about uh, opportunity costs. So if we're uh, we may need to compare to projects, right? So we might compare, okay, we're going to keep the old MRI, but it's going to cost us, you know, a thousand dollars every month to maintain, or we'll buy a new MRI that'll cost us a bunch of money, uh, but it's going to reduce our maintenance fees, right? And so we have the opportunity cost of buying the new uh, equipment um, is the, uh, uh, increased amount of, uh, 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 well, the opportunity cost would be uh, the savings, you know, not uh, the amount of money we could earn by not buying the equipment um, and using the old equipment. Um, so uh, we want to have some sort of comparison cost to compare to uh, two different decisions. That's a, a, a thing you can do. Um, something else we want to think about uh, from a strategic perspective is uh, effects on existing lines, existing lines of business. So if you talk with Jameson, she always, she will, and, you know, talk about uh, different things like, you know, why do we have primary care? You know, we lose money on primary care. We lose money. She'll tell you, lose money on primary care. You lose money on OB. Well, why do hospitals and, and health systems maintain primary care and OB? Well, it's because 
if you have primary care, primary care refers to your lines of business that actually do make money, like orthopedics, like um, uh, 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 oncology, like, uh, you know, your imaging, all that kind of stuff, right? That's where you actually make the money. So, you know, when you think about expanding a business, you've got to think about, is there complementarity, right? Does it fit together? It's not complement like, oh, you know, you look so lovely today. This means complement with an E rather than an I means these two things work together, right? Um, and, and help each other. So is there complementarity um, or is it a substitute, right? In which case you're going to cannibalize, I think it's two ends, cannibalize uh, your business, right? So if I have, if I set up, you know, uh, one of the things that Wentworth Douglas has got to think about is if I build orthopedic services in Portsmouth, am I just, you know, going to take business away from my Dover location uh, and have it show up in Portsmouth? Or am I actually going to get new uh, workload that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise? And so is it a substitute or, uh, or is this, you know, if I build this, this similar business uh, in the next town over, am I going to get, uh, is the business that I get in the new location new business that I wouldn't have gotten, or is it going to be taking business from my old location? So those are issues to think about. Um, let's see what other annoyed things that we want to think about. Um, we also have an effect, we're not really going to get into this in this course, but we have an uh, effects on current accounts. So you remember from chapter uh, four, current account uh, are your short-term, right? Short-term um, assets. So your current assets like accounts receivable, inventory. Um, those are, you know, if you grow your business, you're going to have to have, you know, if you're going to uh, start a new line of business, you're going to have to have more inventory. That's a real cost, right? You have to finance that inventory somehow. Um, you're also going to likely have an increase in accounts payable. Do you have enough cash? Uh, sorry, accounts receivable. Um, do you have enough cash to survive um, uh, while you get into your new cycle of cash flows when you start up your business? You'll have, uh, you'll also probably increase your accounts payable, your continuous accounts payable. So these are things that if you take a more advanced finance course, you would get into managing those kinds of issues. All right, uh, so we're a little low on time. So I, uh, I, the other thing you would think about, so I'll just mention it, is inflation, right? So inflation, um, inflation is an important consideration. It affects your corporate cost of capital, you know, importantly. Uh, remember, the, one of the last questions on exam one had to do with um, uh, how does inflation impact uh, a particular uh, hospital's bonds, right? How much they were paying on their bonds. And, uh, you know, inflation, increases in inflation increase the required rate of return on bonds, right? So uh, if you issue new bonds, if we wind up with uh, inflation happening like right now we're, we're facing probably the most significant, well, uh, we had some pretty significant inflationary pressures coming out of, uh, out of the Great Recession as well. But the government just passed a $2 trillion stimulus bill. They're gonna, you're going to be getting a check in the mail. Uh, or to your, to, your, uh, to your personal account at some point from the IRS uh, or the Treasury Department, rather. Um, uh, probably through the IRS, uh, through their through the IRS's records, you'll be getting some size uh, 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 check in the mail at some point. Having all that money flow into the economy is a significant inflationary pressure. We don't have time to talk about it. Just trust me, trust me it is. Um, and so we're going to have to find some way to pull that money back out of the economy whenever things kind of turn around. Um, so. 
so inflation directly affects the uh, uh, return on debt, required rate of return on debt, which you remember from the prior chapter, uh, the required rate of return on debt uh, is part of calculating the corporate cost of capital. So when inflation goes up, that causes the um, uh, that causes the required rate of return on debt to go up, and in turn, that causes the corporate cost of capital to go up. So, uh, so that's kind of the last point I wanted to make here. All right. So next time, um, we'll jump straight into the example that I had had planned for us to work through. Uh, so we'll do that. So, so next time, uh, have your Excel uh, up and running for class, and um, I think I'll I'll stop a couple minutes early today. So any questions? Any questions on what we did today? A lot of, a lot of background stuff. Um, so next time we'll actually, we're going to work through a capital budgeting um, problem. Everybody's doing all right? Whew. Okay, well then uh, I will let you all go and see you, most of you, uh, hopefully at 340 um, for, uh, uh, for, for next class. All right. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Uh, I hope you're all doing well, um, and hanging in there and I hope your families are doing okay. Uh, and I'll hang out here for a couple of minutes. If you do want to ping me with a, a question.